But this question of fear, we're all afraid of it. And there are things in relationship to this fear that you and I have to recognize, that if you trust in God and let Him be your guide and strength, you won't have that fear. And your fear is in relationship to your trust. As your faith in God gets stronger, your fear dissipates. And as your faith in God gets weaker, your fear arises. You want to have fear dissipated and removed? Then you rise up and hold up the name of the living God and look to Him to undertake for you, and He will. It's our faith that brings victory. It's our faith that casts out fear and enables us to put our trust in the blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We will worship the man of Galilee who went to a cross 2,000 years ago. And no one can take his place. No one will intercede or interfere. We will not permit it. And so it is we have faith without fear. our hope in life and death Christ alone Christ alone what is our only confidence that our souls to him belong who holds our days within his hand what comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end the love of Christ in which we stand oh sing a hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing a hallelujah now and ever we confess Christ, I hope in life and death. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is his grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith? when fears arise who stands above the stormy trial who sends the waves that bring us nigh 
unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what shall we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? everlasting life with him there we will rise to meet the lord then sin and death will be destroyed and we will feast in endless joy when christ is ours forevermore oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing a hallelujah. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever confess Christ our hope in life and death now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death we have a God who is sovereign that he rules over everything. That nothing that we do or don't do changes who God is. He's the king, he's eternal, and yet he cares about us and he invites us into a relationship with him through Christ. The song Sovereign talks about God being over and in all things. And he's present with us. He's the king who made his home among us. Sovereign in the mountain air, sovereign on the ocean floor, with me in the calm, with me in the storm. Sovereign in my greatest joy, sovereign in my deepest cry, with me in the dark, with me at the dawn. In your everlasting arms, all the pieces of my life from beginning to the end I can trust you in your never failing love you work everything for good God whatever comes my way I will trust you sovereign in the mountain air sovereign on the ocean Floor. You're with me in the calm, with me in the storm. Sovereign in my greatest joy, sovereign in my deepest cry. You're with me in the dark, with me at the dawn. In your everlasting arms, all the pieces of my life from beginning to the end. I can trust you in your never failing love. You work everything for good. God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. God, whatever comes my way, 
I will trust you. All my hopes, all I need, held in your hands. All my life, all of me, held in your hands. All my fears, all my dreams, held in your hands. All my hopes, all I need, held in your hands. All my life, all of me, held in your hands. All my fears, all my dreams, held in your hands. In your everlasting arms, of pieces of my life, from beginning to the end, I can trust you. In your never failing love, you work everything for good. God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. Well, good morning and welcome to our online service. Uh, over the past few weeks in our children's ministry here at Yakima Covenant Church, we've been having an emphasis on Ephesians 6, which is the armor of God. The kids have learned about the belt of truth that holds up your life, uh, the breastplate of righteousness so that they'll do the right thing to protect their hearts. Uh, they learned about the shoes of peace that helps bring them the gospel of truth with them wherever they go the shield of faith that protects them from the devil's trials, and the helmet of salvation to protect their whole being. Today, I'll be sharing with you a little bit about Habakkuk, and this is a, his short but his important contribution to the scriptures as a whole. It's here we learn of Habakkuk's faith that lasts to the finish, even though things seem like he is lost even before he begins. So before we begin, I want um, you to pause this video if you need to, go grab your Bible, uh, and you can open it up or maybe get the Bible app and set up on your phone so you can kind of switch back and forth if you want to have that for reference. We'll be looking at the book of Habakkuk, and we'll focus today is on chapter 2, verse 4, and chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. So pause it, get that stuff ready, and let's get into it. I want to start things off with a little background on the book and the author. Uh, we know a little bit about Habakkuk. He's a thinker, he's a writer, he weighs things, he's a prophet. We know that he was, uh, we know that he was selected by God to be his messenger. He's a well-educated person. Uh, he was received an oracle, which is a declaration from God. And sometimes this happens in a dream, or sometimes maybe the Holy Spirit will give him a message. Um, and when Habakkuk received this from the Lord, it happens about 600 years before Jesus is born. Uh, here we get a very unique look into Habakkuk's story. It's something different than most places, because normally prophets talk to people about God, but today we're going to learn that Habakkuk talks to God about people. Prophets usually make a declaration, but Habakkuk starts with a question. So we want to understand this. So what's going on during this time? We know that there were 12 tribes. Uh, David was originally in control of those 12 tribes and they were united, but things started to get divided. And then the 10 in the north, which we call Israel, were taken over by Assyria. We now have the two in the south remaining, which are Judah. But right now they're having fights and they're having problems and they're finding it hard to keep together. They're drifting away from God. We also know the Babylon's becoming a growing concern during this time. King Nebuchadnezzar's rising to power. And this is alluded to in this book of the Bible that he will come uh, to be what can, history considers one of the greatest kings of the empire of Babylon. So with all this going on, this brings us right into the middle of this story. That is the story where Habakkuk confronts God and questions what's happening in the world around him. Let's look at some of this language from Habakkuk 1. Remember, normally a prophet would declare something to, uh, it, from God to his people, but here we're seeing Habakkuk is questioning God's choices. 
says this, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or I cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteousness so that justice is perverted. Here we see Habakkuk has a broken heart. Things are bad for him. He talks about violence in this section here six times using the same word in the, in the Hebrew word. Um, he says, why is there so much evil? Why do you not hear me? Why are the wicked prevailing? Why are you tolerating this wrongdoing? He keeps on asking why. Uh, growing up, I think I was taught that the fear of the Lord was the beginning of wisdom. We don't question the ways of God. And for many situations, I think that's really spot on. Faith is when we believe in something we cannot see. So part of that means we need to have that trust. But Habakkuk shows here that it's okay to ask God things when things don't seem right. He's not questioning God himself as a character. He knows who God is. He's, he understands that. But he's questioning what is happening. So why is this okay? Well, there's a relationship here. Um, if you didn't know, my kids fight a lot. Big surprise. But you wouldn't know it if you weren't close to my family. That's because they fight a lot, but not when they're in public. In public, they seem like great kids. Everyone says, oh, they're so wonderful. But at home, they fight. They fight when they're at home. They question the decisions that I make. They question each other. They make claims of what's fair or really what's lack of fair. They want justice. You see, at home, they feel safe. They feel like they can share their frustration and heartaches with their siblings and with us. There's an element of trust here. They are in a place where they know it's okay to question, and I think Habakkuk is there too. What we learn from Habakkuk is it's okay to question God's decisions when we're in a relationship with Him because we are most vulnerable um, with the people that we love and trust. This isn't a sign of a doubt of Habakkuk. He knows God hears him. He knows God answers. He's a prophet. That's his job. But how he feels right now is that things aren't right, and he knows that he can bring those feelings to God. He knows God can be the only one that can change things. So Job questioned God. Uh, Paul questioned God. Mary, how can this be? She said, how can it be? I'm, I'm with child. They questioned God, but they still trusted. Will you trust God in these situations? When tragedy comes, a look up is much better than a look out. It's the only place we're going to find peace. We're going to find hope. We're going to find understanding. In the same way, we need to do this upward looking because it brings us to our first point here to remember. Faith, not God, but faith can be questioned because God is confident in his abilities. Mike Pellavacci once told me this. He said, he's God, I'm not. He prefers it that way. We see that, that Habakkuk has questions and we're going to learn that God has answers. God knows what's going on. God has things in control. But Habakkuk may not like the answer that he gives him. God tells him that things are probably going to get worse. It's not the answer he wanted. Babylon is going to rise up. They are ruthless. They're promoting their own honor. They're swifter than leopards. They're like vultures. They're going to take advantage and they're going to come in and they're going to change what's happening. They're called here the east wind and that east wind was something that would bring bad things. Destruction. It brought sand. It brought demise. There was no mercy to this wind. It mentions that the Babylons are people here whose strength is their own God. These are people who are self-reliant. They wanted to be at the top. Habakkuk is, is definitely worried hearing this. And we, I think that we all fight this same battle, maybe in a short thing. I want to take a sidestep and kind of look at this idea because if we get some insight on this passage, we may read it and think, oh, the empire of Babylon is so bad. How does God want them to succeed? But maybe we need to look at this story from an outside perspective or with a little different perspective because I see two things from this. First off, I think God wants us to learn a lesson from how he describes the Babylonians. If we put ourselves in this position, it's easy to see that sometimes we are the Babylonians. When our faith is tested, we want to look out and make things change. We want them to be like that. So maybe we become ruthless. Maybe we become self-seeking. We not intentionally bring destruction to the things around us. It's easy for us to read that last section and kind of have it resonate with us. When do we become people who let our own strength become our God? Because I think although it's quite easy to see how bad these Babylonians are, maybe we should see that sometimes the things that we do and the things we put us, ourselves in when we're scared, worried, or just in doubt is the same thing that the Babylonians were doing 2,600 years ago. I think secondly, and more importantly, 
it helps us because it helps us frame the first observation that God still uses those people who are definitely not following him the way God intended. Um, well, not at this time anyway. Uh, these people are so far detached from God that it seems illogical to let them be that system of change that will fulfill God's plan. It brings out this question, how does God use someone who is so detached from him where his very, when his very own people are right there? I think this has to do with the perspective, and I think it will help us navigate through this book. Um, God's perspective is vast. It's huge. Ours is very limited. God sees the beginning, the middle, the end. He sees what needs to happen, and he can put things in a place that may not always make sense to us. This was a time of tragedy for Habakkuk. He was worried for his people, he was worried for the future, and he was hoping that God would give him the exact answer that he wanted. But he doesn't. God doesn't give him the answer that he wanted. Habakkuk questions whether this is a real answer at all, but he does do one amazing thing through this passage. He looks to God, he looks upward instead of outward during this time, even when he doesn't like it. When the tragedy comes, a look up is always a much better thing to do than a look out. It's the only place we're gonna find peace, hope, understanding. Now, Habakkuk does look out some, we know that. He has worries and he has fears of what's happening, and he does even question God's decisions. In the same way, we need to look up. It's natural for us to have that first look out. We're fragile people and we worry. But once we realize that we're looking out, we need to look to the one who's in control. You know, we can say, God, I don't really like this plan. God, I don't really like this plan. But God, can I trust you with this plan? So when we're looking at this story, we have this kind of like a faith sandwich in Habakkuk where he comes to God with a problem and he has faith that he's going to answer it. He questions that problem, but ultimately he comes back to faith. So it goes faith, his question, his faith. And he does this a couple times. That's the way our lives go too, I think, sometimes. Why does God use people who don't follow him? Why do people who should be successful or be unsuccessful be successful? Why should the people who punish, why do they prosper? Um, why do the, oh. You know, isn't that the way our lives go too? We see this so many times. We ask, why does God use people who don't follow him? Why do people who should be unsuccessful, why have they become successful? Why do people that we think should be punished prosper? Habakkuk sees this. He's a sinner and he knows how bad the Babylonians are. This whole verse, or chapter two, he talks about this. How can God, all that is pure, all that is holy, think that this is the proper solution to the problem? Well, as we read through this book and we read through the entire scripture, we see God unveiling his perfect plan. We can step out of the Bible and we can see the whole plan. We have the book. We have the entire thing, beginning, middle, and end. We can see that. We can see God's plan there. Sometimes we don't see that in our own lives. We need to see that. That stories like we read in Scripture that are rooted in God's plan. Habakkuk felt anxious about God's plan, and we do too. But like Habakkuk, we need to come to him and ask the hard questions and know that God is confident enough to accept these and answer the tough questions. We need to realize that just like our Holy Scripture and just like Habakkuk's life, God is in control and God knows what's going to happen in this big plan. It is seen time and time again in the Scriptures where people question um, Him and then the outcome becomes worship. This is the structure of many of the Psalms. The psalmist presents a problem to God. He's concerned uh, because he sees what's right in front of him, but ultimately he comes back to faith in God. And here's where we get to our second point, which is when we read chapter 2 of Habakkuk, we see this. Faith can be frustrating because God has the perspective that we don't. I'd like to wrap things up here, reading through Habakkuk 3, because I think this really helps us out, put the first two points that we've read um, kind of into perspective. So I'm going to read Habakkuk 3 in its entirety, and I want us to think about how it fits into the story of Habakkuk, but also how it fits into the story of our lives. So let's read Habakkuk 3. It says this, Lord, I have heard your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came down from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. 
His glory covered in the heavens, and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise, rays flashed from his head. Where his power was hidden, plague went before him, pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Cushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Why are you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens in the glint of your flying arrows at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth and in your anger threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader from the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us. Gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard, and my heart pounded. Here's a switch. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls. This is verse 18 and verse 19. This is the one I want us to take home with us. I mean, you know it said, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls. Verse 18 says this, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. In looking at the book of Habakkuk, we see the prophet who comes to a realization that God has things in control. They may not feel like it now, but he has things prepared and is ready to complete his purpose. In the word of God, we see how God takes his people, flawed like you and me, to complete his plans and fulfill his purpose. We may feel like Habakkuk. Maybe our situation seems too much. Maybe the people who are succeeding around us are not following God in any way. Maybe we are frustrated that God chose someone else when we think he should have chosen us. But know this, God uses all sorts of people to fulfill his plan, and unlike us, he is unchanging. His plan has been prepared since the beginning of time, and in his plan, he wins. It may not be the same plan we expect or want, but God is in control. He is God, we're not. He prefers it that way. Um, I want to end with a song that tells of the unchanging truth of God. This song is called Yesterday, Today, and Forever. In everlasting God, the years go by and you're unchanging in this fragile world. You are the only firm foundation Always loving, always true Always merciful and good So good And yesterday, today and forever You are the same You never change Yesterday, today, and forever, you are faithful, so we will trust in you. And uncreated one, you have no end and no beginning, earthly powers fade. 
There is no end unto your kingdom Always loving, always true Always merciful and good So good And yesterday, today and forever You are the same You never change Yesterday, today, and forever, you are faithful, so we will trust in you. And Yahweh, God unchanging, you are Yahweh. Firm foundation, Yahweh, oh God unchanging, you are Yahweh, a firm foundation, and yesterday, today, and forever, you are the same. You never change Yesterday, today, and forever oh, You are faithful So we will trust in you We'll trust in you We'll trust in you Why don't we pray? Lord God, we're so thankful. God, we are thankful people that you have a plan. You have a plan for our lives. You have a plan for our world. You have a plan for history. God, help us to trust in you. And God, help us to have a faith that lasts to the finish. Lord, we know that faith is when we trust and when we believe in the things that we cannot see. And God, although we do not see you, we see the evidence of you all around us. God, like Habakkuk, when he talks about all the things that are happening, he knows you're in control. And he says that at the end, that he will choose to have faith in you and rejoice in you, knowing that, God, ultimately, you win. So, God, as we um, leave this service today, as we go through our week, help us to have that faith that lasts to the finish. We pray these things in your mighty name. Amen. Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you In Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. And show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, 
there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart lead me in your love to those around me and i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation yes i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken and i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation i will put my trust in you alone in I will not be shaken holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me